Peace be with you. Welcome to worship with the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Please join me in the call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's, God's steadfast love endures forever. as we do the seal of Christ and trusting in his abiding love for us. Let us join together in confessing our sins before God and one another. Let us pray. By the gift of your grace, we are saved, O God, from all that separates us from you. Still, we would rather believe that we can earn your love. Still, we would rather believe that we are in ultimate control. Forgive us when we do not recognize the gift of your grace. Have mercy when we refuse to share that grace with others. Forgive us, O God, and wash us in your mercy. Forgive us, O God, and free us to try again. Amen.
God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. Today, I want to talk about my most favorite word, and that word is love. Now, you can love your family, you can love your pets, you can love your toys, you can love ice cream, and you can love sunny days. The Bible tells us a lot about love. It tells us that God loves his son, Jesus, and that they love the little children. It tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to show love to one another. In our Bible story today, we hear that Jesus is the light. His light is shining in the darkness for us. Have any of you ever tried to find something in the dark? Maybe you were looking in your closet and there wasn't a light, and maybe you had to go and get a flashlight. Well, to look for something in the dark is one thing, but Jesus tells us that he is the light in the darkness. If we feel lost or sad or lonely, we can remember that Jesus loves us and that his love is a light in the dark. If we follow Jesus, his love will help us out of the dark times in our lives. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love and your light. Help us to spread both into the dark corners of the world. Help us to share your love with everyone we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in our prayer for illumination. Almighty God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, open your word and illumine our world that we may see clearly and live faithfully by the light of your truth in Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's reading is from Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble, and gathered in from the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways because their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love and his wonderful works to humankind. And let him offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 11 through 24. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and spent some time there with them and baptized. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem because water was abundant there, and people kept coming and were being baptized. John, of course, had not yet been thrown into prison. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you remember a specific moment last year when you realized that the COVID-19 virus was going to lead to a lockdown? 
This time last year, I was serving as a presbytery leader and we had been on the phone with the governor's office and so that we knew an executive order was coming and we knew the approximate date. So we were, it makes no sense now, but in our heads, we were scurrying around trying to get our last in-person meetings in before the executive order. And so we had our last meeting and I got in the car and I went to the grocery store and the shelves were empty. And that was when it hit me that the world had shifted, like this shift had happened. As we were closing the offices down last March, the communications coordinator for the presbytery I served, her name is Trudy. Trudy uh, is her day job, which is really a night job, is she is an ICU nurse at a hospital in Newark. And Trudy was telling us that for the last two weeks, there had been nonstop code blues at her hospital. It was never quiet, there was always a code blue. And what she said to us, was based on what she was seeing at her hospital, we needed to go home and we needed to stay home for months. I think we now have a new uh, era to delineate in these times, uh, BC, right, before COVID. I don't know what the after would be. Uh, BC, before COVID, I think it will be a long time before we'll be able to reckon with the magnitude of what's been lost. The people who've died, the businesses that have foundered, the long-term effects on our college-age students upon whose backs we have mismanaged this disease, our school-aged and younger children who are really struggling, our teachers who are having such a tough time. Children need structure. I need structure, <laughs> we all need structure. People need people to be with. We need other people with whom to interact. We have lost congregation members. Congregation members have lost family members. This has been a time of deep darkness this year. It's really extraordinary. It's been a time of deep darkness, but there's also light. There is light, there's so much light. We've witnessed profound instances of leaning into the light, leaning into and leaning on the light of Christ. When we look back on this time, we will lift up and we will remember the places where we saw the light of Christ. My first sermon here with you a couple months ago I preached about looking for and naming the pandemic graces. This is like that. There are so many instances of people and communities leaning into the light during these pandemic times. In our lesson from John 3, Jesus is towards the end of a very long conversation with Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you'll remember, is a Pharisee, so he's a member of the of religious elite. He's intrigued by Jesus and he wants to talk to him some more, so Nicodemus comes to see Jesus in the middle of the night in secret so that he doesn't get um, pushback from the other religious elites. And so this is one of those really deep conversations that are really lengthy that Jesus has with particular people in the Gospel of John. And Jesus has been slowly leading Nicodemus into the light, into a new understanding of God. And this is what Jesus says to him toward the end of the conversation. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. I never paid attention to that verse before. There are a lot of other verses we know really well in this passage, um, but this really struck me this year. Come to the light, deeds done in God. So I wanna tell you some stories about leaning into light and encourage you to think about the own stories that you've witnessed or that you've been part of this year. 
So as it turns out, the director of pastoral care for the Robert Wood Johnson Hospitals is a Presbyterian pastor. Of course she is. Last fall, she shared with some clergy colleagues just a bit about what it was like for chaplains during those first months of COVID in the Northeast last spring. The ICUs were full. There were no more beds. There were not enough ventilators. So many people were dying and they were dying alone. And there wasn't as much known about treatment protocols back at the beginning. And so hospital staff were just despairing. And the chaplains would stand outside the hospital room and hold a phone up, a little phone or a tablet, something so that loved ones could see their loved one in hospital room, you know, ventilated, all that stuff, to say goodbye with no one else in that room back at the beginning. And the weeks ran together with endless death and crisis. And as you know, hospital chaplains look after the hospital staff as well as the patients. And hospital staff were spiraling. It was so hard to keep up with the onslaught. It was impossible. So this Presbyterian pastor, who is the director of pastoral care at the Robert Wood Johnson Hospitals, she's married and she has preschool aged children at home. And the chaplain staff made a decision to quarantine themselves away from their homes for the first six to eight weeks of the onslaught of the pandemic so that they could be present for hospital staff, they could be present for patients and they could keep their families safe at home. That's a long time to be away from your preschool aged children. We will want to hear more and know more about the heroism of hospital chaplains during this pandemic. They have embodied God's light in the darkest of times at great personal sacrifice. But those who do what is true come to the light, Jesus says to Nicodemus. Another story, this congregation is very connected to the mission of Nourish, New Jersey, Nourish NJ. And Nourish NJ has been a beacon of light in this area during this pandemic time. They have a small staff, dedicated staff, including our, our own Julie. They have been able to successfully shift their service model to accommodate social distancing and safety while meeting the ever endless expanding needs of their guests. A number of folks here at the Presbyterian Church in Morristown are involved in making meals and meal kits for guests so that guests can pick them up and take them with them. We currently organize a breakfast bag initiative on the fourth Thursday of the month. There is a new, I saw this on Facebook this week, there's a new Nourish NJ initiative called Purposeful Acts of Kindness, PAC, Purposeful Acts of Kindness Kits. These pack kits are care packages with a specific list of frequently asked for personal care necessities. So guests will be able to come and pick them up and take them with them. You can find information about the pack kits on the Nourish NJ Facebook page and the sign up genius for that is already full for the next two weeks. It's really extraordinary. Nourish NJ's outreach team has been working nonstop to try and keep people in their homes, to stop evictions, to help with rent and with household expenses. It seems that whatever the need is, Nourish NJ, this small intrepid group of people and the huge number of volunteers who work with them will figure out how to address that need. It's remarkable, it's remarkable. Their deeds are done in God as Jesus says. One more light story. Last year, I had the privilege of working really closely with the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance staff. P. 
PDA, we call them, lots of acronyms in Presbyterian world, PDA. I coordinated the writing of emergency and short-term recovery grants for churches and nonprofits in two presbyteries in New Jersey at the onset of the pandemic. And so I was on the phone a lot with PDA staff and they are so dedicated to their work. They completely retooled their mission to accommodate the emergency needs of a global pandemic rather than a specific geographically located emergency. This was really difficult for PDA staff to do. You will remember that last year's one great hour of sharing offering sort of got lost in the pandemic shuffle in the, in the shutdown last spring and an enormous percentage of Presbyterian disaster assistance annual budget comes from the one great hour of sharing offering. So the PDA staff was trying to address incomparably expanded need with a smaller budget than usual. And in spite of that, PDA funded emergency grants across the globe, across this country, focusing on the needs of the most vulnerable. In my two presbyteries, PDA funded emergency grants for food and for medicine, for help with rent, um, to restock food pantries, which were seeing way more traffic than they had before. The PDA staff is small in number uh, and great in heart. They worked around the clock for two months trying to do the red tape to push the grants out as quickly as possible. PDA, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, is one of the best things that we do as Presbyterians. In New Jersey, we've been the beneficiaries of their long-term recovery work after Superstorm Sandy. Many of us have participated in other long-term recovery initiatives of PDA uh, after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, for example. Where there is a disaster or emergency, um, the flooding in Hawaii this week, PDA personnel will be there within 24 to 36 hours on the ground in their blue windbreakers, ready to help, boots on the ground. Uh, you will hear a minute from mission in a few minutes asking you to give to the one great hour of sharing. And so I just wanted to let you know, if you didn't know already, that Presbyterian Disaster Assistance is a major beneficiary of the One Great Hour of Sharing offering. And they need our support so that they can continue to support people in crisis, wherever it is the crisis is. It's, they're extraordinary. Extraordinary. These are stories of ordinary people facing these pandemic days, doing extraordinary work in the name of Christ for the sake of the world. And we too, we're part of that light. Our call is to lean into the light, to serve the world in Jesus' name. Our call is to bear witness to the light when we see it. Ordinary people serving God in these extraordinary times, doing extraordinary things, bearing witness to the light of Christ. These Lenten days, let us lean into the light. Let us be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I am Vicki Wilson representing the Outreach Committee inviting you all to participate in the One Great Hour of Sharing offering, which will be dedicated on Palm Sunday on March 28th. You may send a check or donate online, and we thank you so much if you have already done that. In the past, members of this church have given generously to this annual appeal, and thus helped people in this country and all over the world fight poverty, disaster, lack of food and water, and compromised health. As you know, a most important goal of One Great Hour is to empower people with skills, education, resources, and funds so that they can become part of the solution and not just receivers. 
During Lent, our online church newsletter is including stories and videos of One Great Hour recipients, such as Manuel and his struggle to keep fishing as his livelihood, or Trinity White Plume and her food gardens, or Mama O and her work to help victims of sexual abuse, herders in Somalia fighting drought, and immigrants in Los Angeles, Koreatown, standing up to injustice at all levels. Your contributions help to enable all of this, and we Morristown Presbyterians, so incredibly blessed, have always given and given and given still more to this important mission as one way for us to share God's blessings with those who need them. Thank you so very much for your support. At this time, we invite you to participate in the offering, to offer your gratitude and commitment to God through the mission and ministry of this congregation. Thanks be to God for our life together. Amen. Let us open our hearts and minds in prayer to God. Gracious, abundant, life-changing God, we pause in this moment simply to experience your presence more deeply, to take in your unbounded love for us, and to open our eyes and hearts just a little more to recognize everything as gift from you. Draw us deeper into Jesus Christ and his transformative grace, and by his light, lead us from the comfort of darkness and selfishness and disordered priorities into a life of freedom as children of the light. As we pray this day for the suffering, violence, greed, and abuse we encounter all around us and even within us, grant us the gift of hope that we may not grow discouraged. Bind us to the rock of your mercy and compassion, that from this foundation we may draw boldness and courage to continue our witness to your just kingdom. We lift before you the persecuted, the abused, the trafficked and enslaved, all who live daily with the deep wounds of racism and those haunted by fear of deportation and separation from their families. Pour out your healing, Lord, Raise up those brought low by our collective sinfulness. Inspire us with new ways to build a community of justice and cooperation. We pray too, as you taught us, for those who persecute, abuse, traffic, and enslave, those who rigorously defend systems of injustice, those who blame the victim instead of owning responsibility, and all who turn their backs on neighbors in need. Pour your grace upon them to soften their hardened hearts, to convert their hearts and minds, to free them from their sin, and to lead them into a new purpose for their lives. And we ask the same grace for ourselves to expose and root out that darkness and sin wherever it may lurk within us. We pray for the grief we all carry in different ways as we mark one year since our worship moved online and life as we knew it came to a halt. We pray for the ongoing effects of COVID-19 in our personal lives, in our communities, and in our world. Grant us patience and perseverance as we all grow increasingly anxious for a return to normal, as we wait for wider vaccine administration, and as we wait to see exactly what is going to happen next. And we pray for all who are ill in body, mind, or spirit, and for those who love and care for them. Pour out your healing and strength upon them. And be with those whom we know and love, with April, Lynn, as he grieves the loss of his wife, Tyler, Beth, and all we name before you now. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. We ask all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.